Tonight on Nova, the Titanic. In 1912, the unthinkable happens when this unsinkable liner sinks. In the aftermath, Titanic's sister ship Britannic is built stronger, safer. But just four years later, Britannic goes down twice as fast. What went wrong? Today, an ambitious undersea explorer uses state-of-the-art technology to search the watery grave of Titanic's lost sister. Nova is funded by Prudential. Prudential. Insurance, health care, real estate, and financial services. For more than a century, bringing strength and stability to America's families. And by Merck. Merck, pharmaceutical research. Dedicated to preventing disease and improving health. Merck committed to bringing out the best in medicine the corporation for public broadcasting and viewers like you aboard this ship moored off the island of Crete an undersea exploration prepares to get underway Oceanographer Bob Ballard, renowned for his discovery of Titanic in 1985, is setting out to explore an intriguing wreck. Titanic's forgotten sister, Britannic. The expedition will need an impressive array of deep sea technology. And Ballard does not travel lightly. Besides the crew of the support ship, Carolyn Chuest, he has in tow three historians, two remotely operated vehicles, or ROVs, equipped with cameras, and a small U.S. Navy nuclear submarine, the NR-1. The object of his search has a remarkable heritage sister to Titanic, a ship whose fate still captures our imagination. Britannic is the last of a formidable trio built by the White Star Line in an effort to dominate the North Atlantic passenger trade. Her history is cloaked in intrigue. Britannic sinking while serving as a hospital ship during World War I is still the subject of much debate. Was she the victim of a deliberate German submarine attack? Or did she hit a mine intended for a military target? The historians on board, Simon Mills, the only published author on Britannic, and Eric Sauter, an expert on the White Star Line, are hoping this expedition will resolve the mystery. A third expert, Ken Marshall, is the foremost illustrator of Titanic and other notable 20th century ships. The technical accuracy of Ken's work has made him invaluable to Ballard in past expeditions. Yeah, this is a painting that I did about five years ago of the Britannic um, as we think it may have looked to see a twin sister ship of the Titanic, virtually identical in, in, in most respects, her dimensions and so forth, to, to sense the size of that ship on the ocean floor, and a, particularly in a shallow enough depth where I can actually see the ship with filtered sunlight coming through the, through the ocean. It should be an eerie and awesome experience. So a course of 210 from his present position. Ballard is also excited at the prospect of seeing Titanic's sister ship lying on the ocean floor. That way they might bottom. The discovery of Titanic was the highlight of his career. But since then, thousands of objects have been salvaged from the wreck site. Powerless to stop it, he has explored other wrecks in the pursuit of a personal vision. I've been really searching 
for the optimum piece of history to experiment on and try to create the first undersea museum. I thought it might have been the Lusitania, but when we went out there, it was so tragic to see how destroyed it was. There's certain things we must preserve. I mean, the Titanic was incredible. The feelings, the power of going there was like going to Gettysburg the day after the battle. Why should I be the only one that gets to go to a place and as soon as I leave, it's, it's left? That's what's really brought me here to the, to the Britannia. It has not been pillaged in very few years. The technology will make it possible for people in the luxury of their homes on the information highway to visit this site live. I would love to protect this ship, set it aside, and, and let people visit it. And I'm going to do it. I'm going to give it my best shot. Ballard is gambling that after 80 years underwater, Britannic will be in good enough condition to display as the first undersea museum. Before he can determine that, he and David Olivier, the commander of the NR1, must first locate the wreck. Then your divers in the water. Put our divers in the water to put the, uh, the cameras and the strobes on. Our first reconnaissance uh, submergence. The NR-1 and the Carolyn Chuez make their way to the Kea Channel. Britannic lies 400 feet below the surface of the Aegean off the island of Kea. Below decks on the support ship, the historians pour over the models of the ill-fated sister ships. White Star struck out so badly with this, this, the big three. But the work at hand cannot obscure the fact that for explorer and historian alike, the object of their search is not just another shipwreck. Britannic and her sisters possess a mystique. They are powerful symbols that speak to us from another time. The largest and most luxurious of their day, they were among the first of a new breed of superliner that would revolutionize transatlantic travel. While their upper decks catered to the wealthy, the real money was made down below in steerage. Immigrants, millions of immigrants, by 1905 was the first million passenger year of the North Atlantic liners wanted to get from the old world to the new. And the only way they could go was by sea. And that accounts for two things. First, the enormous number of ocean liners that were built for the North Atlantic. And second, their incredible size. Belfast, Ireland, in the deserted corners of the modern Harland and Wolf shipyard, are visible reminders of the massive effort it took to build these very special transatlantic steamers. The pride of the White Star Line, Olympic, first of the class. Legendary Titanic, and lastly, Britannic, the forgotten sister. The magnificent interiors of these ships have either been lost to the ocean depths or dismantled. This room is all that remains. We're in the White Swan Hotel, in the interior of the lounge of the Olympic. It's all that we have left from her. There are, there are bits and pieces of her all over England, but... Um, Perhaps nothing quite as lovely as the lounge. And it's a splendid reminder of those fabulous days of 1911, 1912, before the war, before all these wonderful ships were swept away. A gilded era. Despite the attention lavished on decor, 
It was also an era of technological innovation. Perhaps Harland and Wolff's greatest accomplishment was the simultaneous construction of Olympic and Titanic in just four years. At the time of their launching, their unprecedented size and luxury made headlines. But as we recall their story today, it was the failure of their innovative safety systems that captures our interest. The Olympic-class ships were designed with 15 transverse bulkheads extending above the waterline, creating 16 compartments separated by massive watertight doors. In the event of flooding, the captain could instantly close those doors from the bridge by means of an electric switch. An innovative backup system allowed the doors to be closed both manually and by a float mechanism. Damage could be sustained to any two adjoining compartments, or the first four starting at the bow, without endangering the ship. This system of safety features would prompt the most reputable of British shipbuilding magazines to call the Olympic class practically unsinkable. That word unsinkable came actually from the great Bible of the British shipping industry called the uh, Shipbuilder and Marine Engine Builder. This was the great uh, journal of shipping that every sh new ship appeared in. And at, at lengthy articles were written about the ship and all the safety systems. And in this article, they talked about the watertight uh, compartments, which every ship had. And it said if these doors were closed, it would render the ship practically unsinkable. Fair enough. Well, somebody grabbed Unsinkable, not the White Star Line, out of that report and circulated it on both sides of the Atlantic as though Titanic were unsinkable. It was an unfortunate label. As Britannic's keel was laid in Belfast, the greatest maritime disaster of this century would claim Titanic and in the same moment alter Britannic's fate. Titanic collided with an iceberg on her maiden voyage and sank in less than three hours, taking some 1,500 souls with her, and making the limitation of her much touted safety features tragically clear. The iceberg came through here, started scraping along, scraping off rivet heads, buckling the plates, tearing the seams apart. Not a big gash like a can opener, but but just a scraping that, that buckled the plates in. Went from here for about 240 feet or so aft, two feet into the coal bunker of boiler room number five. The bow started to sink. The water eventually, inevitably, came up over that that bulkhead and flowed into the next compartment and into the next. And it was just a mathematical certainty, plain and simple. No matter how you sliced it, the ship's going down. Titanic was doomed. Why the staggering loss of life? The time it took for the ship to sink should have allowed ample opportunity to evacuate all on board. The disaster reached epic proportion because of a bureaucratic oversight. The Olympic-class ships had far too few lifeboats due to outdated Board of Trade regulations. The regulations had been written in 1894 when the largest ship afloat was considerably smaller than Titanic. Of the more than 2,000 passengers and crew on board, only 705 would survive. The disaster stunned the world. White Star immediately recalled the Olympic from service and halted construction on Britannic. Harland and Wolfe set about correcting every flaw that might have contributed to Titanic's demise. In the case of the Britannic, that was fairly easy to do because the ship had not advanced very far in terms of its construction. In the case of the Olympic, the reconstruction was so extensive that it took the ship out of service for six months. The safety features of these two ships were completely overhauled. They were fitted with an inner skin that ran the length of the boiler and engine room compartments. Five of the bulkheads were extended up as far as the bridge deck. These precautions would allow both ships to float with six compartments flooded, two more than Titanic. Belfast, February 1914. Britannic is finally launched. The new passenger liner was hailed by the shipping line and the builders to be as perfect a specimen of man's creation.